Hello, and welcome to this year's Feminist Museum of Grassroots Action, commemorating World Day Against Trafficking in Persons. This day is held annually on July 30th to draw awareness to a very difficult, complex, and hidden crisis. My name is Kristen Byrne, and I am a U.S. associate joined in the New York office by summer interns Ronalini, Penny, and Fatumata, who will be taking you through the museum. This year's World Day Against Trafficking in Persons aims to raise awareness of disturbing developments and trends that fuel trafficking systems, calling on governments, law enforcement, public services, and civil society to assess and enhance their efforts to strengthen prevention, identification, and support of victims and end impunity. Apniop works to disrupt systems of sex trafficking and is committed to empowering marginalized women and children to kick and fly. I invite you to walk through the museum and I hand the tour off to Penny. Hi everyone, I am a summer intern at Apniop. My name is Penny and I will walk you through our approach, a little bit of our story and our approach. Um, Apne Up was started years ago when Ruchir was walking through the foothills of Nepal and came across the village and discovered that there were several, there were no girls in the village and she found out that they were in Mumbai and that prompted her to discover the sex trafficking industry through her own eyes and create a documentary called The Selling of Innocence. With the women from that documentary, they all co-founded Apne Up and this is where we are today. So I will walk you through our 10 assets very briefly. Basically, our approach um, follows a 10 asset program. Helping women and girls out of prostitution is one thing, and it's a very crucial one, but it's not enough. A prostituted woman or girl is not an isolated entity. She is a brushstroke in the much larger picture of complex sex trafficking systems that feed off of family dynamics, intergenerational cycles of prostitution, poverty, and criminal hierarchies. So this is where our approach is a bit different. We, um, our 10 asset program comes in. It's an approach that ensures once women and girls leave the clutches of pimps, they possess enough choices to never fall back into them. We safeguard daughters from entering intergenerational cycles of prostitution. And we really just set these women up to flourish on their own, create networks that will serve to support them for generations to come. Um, I'll briefly gloss over some of these. Our main goals are to establish safe spaces within the red, light areas so that people can access them easily. We really want to educate these women. That includes financial literacy, business strategies, anything from as simple as how to read a train ticket to know where they're going to how to read and write, um, really educate them on their fundamental rights, how to approach um, legal discourse, how to file police reports. This covers a very wide variety. Then, um, you know, it goes from self-confidence which really helps build self-esteem we try to establish political power give them government ids to have an identity government subsidies to help build a foundation so they don't have to resort to prostitution we offer legal support to really help hold their perpetrators accountable we also provide savings and bank accounts uh, livelihood linkages, which involves training to create a business or a profession after prostitution to continue to support themselves and their families. And then we really end with these self-empowerment circles that aim to just keep the support going and make sure that prostitution is never an option. And these women can really support and encourage each other and just help the next generation of vulnerable girls and women. And then over here, we have a series of survivor art that was generously given to us. And I will briefly mention some stories pulled from our Voices of Red Light Areas book. These are written by young girls that we, we put together this project to kind of allow them to articulate through short essays and photographs what they believe sex trafficking to be in their experiences. And I'll read a quick short excerpt. The place where we live is called a red light area. Most people hate us if they come to know that we live in this locality. I wish when I grow up to take my parents and other members of my family to another place, but I know that those who stand below the street lamps do not do it by choice. They have to do it to fill their stomachs. 
but I have a wish to stop this and get them some good work. For this, they must have education. They must be given training and different skills. I wish to teach them, train them, and work to make our environment better. Alrighty, I will now pass this over to Mernalini. She will go over our impacts. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So glad that you're joining us today to talk about such an important day. Um, so I'm going to talk about how Apnea, along with actually physically doing grassroots work in India, has also uh, tried to make a difference by changing laws and policies all over the world. Um, because we do believe that these things go hand in hand, and it's very important to have to get women out of prostitution, but also to make sure that prostitution does not happen again. There have to be laws that act as deterrents. Um, and since we believe in a world where no woman or girl is bought or sold, uh, we have been campaigning all over the world. So I will talk about a couple of things that we have done in the past, um, starting with the Immoral Trafficking Prevention Act. This is an act that was established in 1956 following a UN protocol. So India ratified the act. Uh, but in 2011, Apnea felt the need to ask for certain amendments to this bill uh, because we wanted harsher punishment for those who were trafficking women and girls and children in general. And uh, there were a couple other countries that were following different mo models and we wanted to talk about that. Um, so we proposed a fine and a seven to 10 year imprisonment for established perpetrators. Uh, we wanted life imprisonment for repeat offenders, um, people who attempted to traffic or abetted trafficking of persons would also be awarded similar prison lengths. Um, we also took inspiration from the Norway model and we proposed a punishment of or imprisonment of up to six months or a 10,000 rupee fine or both for those aiding and abetting or engaging in paid sexual activity. Um, we also specifically uh, imposed a similar fine for those engaging in such activities with persons under the age of 18. Uh, we placed state responsibility for on we, re we placed responsibility on the state uh, for the removal and rehabilitation of sexually exploited children, along with coming up with a comprehensive plan of action to provide them education and livelihood skills so they do not feel the need to fall back into the cycle of prostitution to keep themselves alive. Um, and perpetrators were liable to a fine of up to 10 lakhs, which is about $14,000, and up to seven years of imprisonment. We also wanted to outlaw soliciting for prostitution in print, electronic media, uh, or the internet for escort services of or massage parlor services, which are often disguised as that, uh, but are actually supporting sex trafficking. After that, uh, in 2013, uh, in a state called Patna in India, uh, Apne Aap realized that uh, girls from our Kasturba Gandhi Balika Vidyalaya, which is a school, were being taken out of school by their foster parents or guardians and being pushed into prostitution. Uh, moreover, we also realized that abandoned babies were being kidnapped from clinics to be groomed and sold into prostitution once they hit puberty. Once we realized that the government is unable, unable to take action against this and it does not have the capabilities to do so, we appealed to the Patna High Court with a public interest litigation where uh, we directed that the state appoints special police officers and conducts the, the raids that it conducts should include female officers, uh, that the state should maintain proper shelter homes for these women and children, and that the children of sex workers should be admitted to appropriate class levels in government schools. Uh, the judgment observed that uh, an integrated approach was required against sex trafficking and human trafficking in general. Um, and it gave importance to setting up village-level anti-trafficking bodies. Uh, it also directed that the state implement its directions within two months from the passing of the judgment. Um, and when it came to prosecution, the court said that in such cases, the bent 
asked the state government to appoint the special police officers and special courts for hearing and disposing of such cases effectively and in a time-bound manner. And now we move on to another law, which is Section 370 of the Indian Penal Code. And Sophia will tell us a little bit about that. I'm an intern at OPNIOP, and I focused my research on Section 370 of the IPC for the Virtual Feminist Museum. So in 2013, OPNIOP mobilized our network to push for this new law against trafficking in the Indian Penal Code. So this law, specifically Section 370, admonishes traffickers instead of victims, shifting the blame away from victims in a legal standpoint and towards the traffickers. This law was landmark because it championed these essential rights for trafficked women and children. And without OPNIOP's tireless advocacy and commitment to passing Section 370, we might not see the progress that we've seen today. It allowed trafficking to enter the national conversation in India in many profound ways. And these tireless efforts allowed for prostitution to be codified as exploitation in the law, thereby protecting victims in the face of traffickers who were previously held unaccountable. So Section 370 specifically clarified the laws around exploitation of trafficked women and children. The law stipulates that the term exploitation refers to any form of sexual enslavement. Most importantly, this law includes provisions for the punishment of traffickers. These punishments can include lengthy prison sentences and fines, and specifically strikes down against perpetrators who traffic groups of women or minors. Additionally, the section admonishes public servants who are knowingly involved in the trafficking process, and these traffickers can face imprisonment for life. Essentially, OPNIOP's staunch advocacy for Section 370 worked to dismantle these systems that held trafficking in place from the ground up. By including criminalization against traffickers, we're protecting victims' rights and advocating for women across the world. And this law sets a precedence for future codes by setting it into the national law and again adding it into the national conversation. And now for the real impact, as you can see in that video there, uh, those are the girls at Apneyab uh, learning how to do karate. And we have had girls uh, and children in general, learning that for a very long time. Um, moreover, in the last five months, uh, we have distributed 1,550 sanitary pads. Uh, we supported the education of 3,362 children. In this quarter, we supported 394 girls uh, in education, ranging from preschool to college, so from age 4 to 26 years. In Kolkata and Bihar, 68 girls have started their own businesses or joined a tailoring shop after graduating from our sewing classes. In these six months, 16 girls have also started their own businesses or joined a tailoring shop. And our latest business initiative is a food truck in Delhi run by a cooperative of 11 women. That's it for the impact. And now I hand it over to Fatu Mada, who will talk about I Kick and I Fly, our founder and president, Ruchira Gupta's debut novel. Thank you. Hello. Now on to our next exhibition, showcasing the story of Hira. The main character of Ruchira Gupta's debut novel, I Cake and I Fly. For those of you who are unaware of what is slowly becoming an internationally acclaimed novel, I Cake and I Fly follows the story of Hira, a 14 year old girl in Forbes Ganj, India, as she fights to escape the cycle of sex trafficking through becoming one of her body with karate. Throughout the book, we are introduced to characters like Mira D. <clears throat> the cousin of Hira who has been forced into prostitution, her story leaning more towards reality for those in the red light districts in India. Alternatively, we follow characters such as Rini D as she empowers, supports, and provides a safe space for Rira and her peers, a perfect case of the duality shown in the novel. Why karate, you may ask? Well, in order to succeed and win her competitions, Hira had to make herself one and redefine the meaning of her body. And what's more empowering than that? Mm -hmm. Additionally, Nishira herself sees Bruce Lee as an inspiration and his quote, be like water, my friend, which means to be flexible in both mind and body. 
In the genre of young adult novels, a plot as far removed from the classic fairy tales and rainbows turns many heads. How did you come up with such a plot? Many have asked it, Rachira. The truth is, I Kick in a Fly is a testament to the stories of our girls in At Apnea. I Kick and I Fly is inspired by a collection of stories from girls we have worked with in the Apnea Network. We've encountered these girls through, we've encountered these girls through our community centers that provide safe spaces for girls living in real life areas and our Kung Fu initiatives training young girls in self-defense and body autonomy. The skills accumulated in our martial arts classes help protect our girls from coercion and intimidation, often caused by gender discrimination and attempts to trap them into prostitution. Observing such girls, we noticed how these skills became instrumental in their winning competitions and demanding respect from those previously stigmatizing them. Here is an amalgamation of the strength and self-confidence Rachira witnessed developing in Apniap's girls. Through the power of her body, she broke the cycles of intergenerational prostitution, ultimately turning her suffering to something beautiful. At Apniap, we recognize that the youth are the future, but we also maintain that they are the present just as well. Activism can start at any age, in any form. It doesn't take much to fight for what you believe in. To those girls who identify with Hera, to those being forced into prostitution, to those who struggle to see their true potential, to those girls whose wings have been tied back, we hope you can fight, kick, fly, and soar. What a powerful message. Something I love about this book is how it boldly approaches topics that children are traditionally sheltered from, such as sex and prostitution, but frames it in a way where it both touches the reader and educates them at once. Some might call prostitution and sex trafficking taboo topics, claiming that children and adolescents are too young to be exposed to these things. But I ask you this, the girls forced into brothels before they finish grade school, some not even reaching double digits, aren't they too young as well? It's never too early to educate our youth. Remember, we are your future. Apart from the overarching theme of sex trafficking, the novel touches on themes such as gender violence and gender inequality, but also the trials that Hira faces, like bullying, finding a sense of belonging, and family relationships. These are classic coming-of-age dilemmas. The story of Hira might take place in India, but her experiences reach us all the way across the world. Let's take a look at what her story teaches us. Here are some of the lessons. One, change begins from within. Two, discovering the value of your body allows for the discovery of yourself. And three, don't let circumstances put you in a box. Now, let's hear from our living, breathing inspirations, the girls who are the living embodiments of Hera and how they've kicked and flown, whether it be through educating themselves, educating others, or simply allowing themselves to dream passionately. Their experiences create the character we know as Hera today along with dozens of other girls. Now let's look at the stories of Ms. Madhu Kanak and Anisha as they tell us how they've sparked change. Ms. Madhu is a teacher that teaches sewing and educates her students by empowering them with skills. Kanak is, Kanak is a, Kanak dares to pursue her dreams by dreaming to be a teacher and pursuing an education. And finally, Anisha uses her knowledge to pursue greater education at her boarding school. Now, I'll be passing it on back to Penny as she leads us to the next part. Hello again. So I will briefly go over some more material in our museum that is available for your viewing to check out on your own time. But in this area, it's a bit hard to navigate. We have some poems pulled from our Voices from a Red Light District book. They were written by young girls. One, I believe, is as young as nine years old. Um, we have some stories written by girls over here, written by Aradana 14. And then here are some drawings that were drawn by young girls that we work with to kind of help them cope 
with the psychological strain of either being prostituted or knowing someone who has been prostituted. And I really encourage you guys to take a look at these drawings. Um, and then briefly, if you head over here, you can see some biographies of our interns this summer. They, it's a really diverse group of students that we've put together and I think it would be really cool to read about them. And lastly, we have Kristen who will come in and end this presentation for you guys. Hello, once again, um, thank you all for joining us and walked through the museum thus far. I hope you have become inspired and gently sensitized to the complexities of the reality that many people live day in and day out. And we just invite you to get involved in combating human trafficking. And there are many ways to do so. Uh, starting with, we invite you to donate towards our Kung Fu for Girls at Risk Human Trafficking program. Uh, we, again, empower young children to use their bodies as an empowering tool to combat bullies and those that may try to take advantage of them through trafficking. And we also use our dojos to connect the children in our network to resources uh, for education and access to food and safe spaces. And so uh, it really is a holistic program that provides connectivity and mentorship for those in need in the red light districts. Lastly, we invite you to our seventh annual Last Girl Awards. It will be held in New York City on September 30th. It'll be a full day of activities. And by day, we will hold demo workshops using martial arts, dance, storytelling, and art, along with the theme, I Kick and I Fly, The Power of Our Body. And the workshops will be geared for young people to hear and learn how to fight for themselves against bullying, body shaming, sexual abuse, and human trafficking. By evening, we will celebrate our honorees. We will have iconic leaders who have stood up for bodily autonomy, body positivity, and body empowerment of young people uh, with the Last Girl Awards, followed by an insightful conversation and panel discussion surrounding I Kick and I Fly, hosted by our founder, Ruchira Gupta, reflecting her debut novel. And lastly, the evening will close with a cocktail reception and a great opportunity to mingle with fellow activists. And it will be a fantastic uh, networking opportunity, and we hope to see you there.